What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and this is... Erica. And today we're going to be giving the once over to Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Let's go, let's go! Hey, what are you queens doing in our car? There will be spoilers. So Erica is my best friend of many, many, many years. More than one of us likes to name. One of us. (laughs) We are too old to bounce. And you might remember her. She's been on my channel before. She and I talked about Empire Records, which was one of our favorite films growing up. Uh, But another one of our favorite films growing up was Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dad. And with the upcoming remake of this movie, now's the time to... Finally talk about it. Yes. <laughs> um, so I don't remember the first time that we watched this. I think the first time that I saw it was with you. Did you ever see it like in theaters or anything? We were oh, too young for no. that. Okay. So it came out in 1991. We're young enough that we weren't seeing this in yes. theaters. Boasting and bragging. <laughs> but it did get a lot of TV spots in between um, the Married with Children airings because it also stars Christina Applegate right. as swell. I remember us really liking this movie in like, I want to say middle school, but then you were saying I, I think it was high early, school? early high school that we, that's when we were re-watching the movie on it. <laughs> Constantly. And you gave me a copy of this movie as a birthday present one year. This movie is actually kind of interesting because it is the first film that was ever released on DVD before VHS. Neat, right? That's that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't feel as old hearing that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what do you think are some of the things that made us gravitate to this movie so much? It was the one-liners and just the weird characters. We loved Gus's character. (laughs) We would pause and rewind and replay that scene (laughs) because it was the funniest thing in the world to us. And this is kind of a weird movie also because it doesn't really fit into one specific genre. It's not really a black comedy. It's not really a teen comedy. It doesn't really fit in with the 80s teen comedies. It doesn't really fit in with the 90s teen comedies. It's kind of in this just gray area of you don't really know what to think about it, which makes it just weird, right? And nothing in the movie is super relatable. Like, everything is so, so far-fetched. Every character, every situation, and yet you watch it and you don't, you don't think of it until you're re-watching it. Yeah. It's kind of an absurdist comedy in that way, yeah. no? <laughs> That's, I never thought about that before. Um, so the basic plot of this film is that Swell and her four siblings are very excited that their mom is leaving to go to Australia for two months, and they are going to have the house to themselves. They are 17, 15, 10... I don't know. They're young. They're young. So, of course, even though they think they're getting the house to themselves, their mom gets a babysitter who turns out to be the oldest lady in all land. I'm the babysitter. And unsurprisingly, she dies. What? We already know that from the title. No spoilers there. So the rest of the film is all about how they handle this. Especially when... The babysitter dies, and all of the money that was left for them goes with her. She must have had an honor. Whoops. Well, it's ours. Go back and get from the old hag. So it starts out with an opening animated sequence, which I love. Yeah. It is so successful. And something that I just learned is that Dan Castellaneta, who is the voice of Homer Simpson, is actually the animated voice of the babysitter. No way. Yeah. Super that's, cool, right? That's one thing that always uh, kind of bumped me out at the end of the movie is that we didn't have that animation on the back end. Yeah. Like, that would have been just so cool to, to tie it off with that at the end because the beginning is... It's beautiful. It's so, and it's fun. It's, it's a fun so sequence. Fun. It sets you up for what you know is going to be a comedy. Yeah. This movie came out in 1991, like we said, and it was directed by Stephen Herrick, who also directed Critters and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And, of course, it stars Christina Applegate as Swell. 
um, or Sue Ellen, but I like the name Swell so much. I think that when we were kids, I really wanted my name to be Swell. I was like, that's such a cool name. Why don't I have that I'm name? I'm sure Christina Applegate yeah. nudged, nudged your liking to the name. Yeah, <laughs> just a teeny bit. Well, I mean, you know, whatever. So... Again, I kind of mentioned that, and you brought up the point, that this is kind of an absurdist comedy. Would you ever leave your kids alone with a stranger for two months? No. Yeah. Like, no. I've had a very rough 37 years, and I need a break. While you go gallivant in Australia? But, then again, this is 30 years ago. Yeah. This is 30 years ago. There's a lot more trust back then. You want to hear something depressing? Mm -hmm. The mom was 37 in this movie. Oof. Yeah. In your bra. Well, and another, but another thing nowadays, I mean, you can video chat, and there's just the communication to go to the other side of the world, isn't as distant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly I, less horrifying. Slightly less horrifying. They were but still using landlines back then. Yeah, and the fact that the mother just never catches on that the babysitter's never there when she calls. Weird. Oh, uh, Mrs. Sturak? Well, she's not here right now. No, she had a date. Some guy. A mortician. The family consists of Swell, Christina Applegate, who is 17 years old. Her younger brother, Kenny, who I think is 15. He's played by Keith Coogan. Uh, Keith Coogan is actually Jackie Coogan's grandson. Mm -hmm. Now close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You know I know nothing. <laughs> okay, yeah. He cool. was Uncle Fester on the Adams family. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah cool. And he actually had a wig maker, um, like Jackie Coogan did. And the wig maker that made Jackie Coogan's wigs is the same wig maker who made Keith Coogan's wigs for this film. Oh. Right? No way. You don't care at all. So those beautiful locks by Kenny throughout most of the movie are just a wig. I know, I'm very sad about that, because I think we both know I had a crush on him when we were growing up. Holy shit. Yeah. It's a shame. His real hair is the end of, uh, at the end of the movie, that's his real hair. Shut up, Quizoid. In addition to that, they have younger <laughs> sister, Melissa, as well as Zach, played by Christopher Pettit. Um, he actually was supposed to have a lot more in the film, but he had a very big drug problem. He was 15 at the time of filming, and he was so messed up that they had to cut a ton of his scenes. Oh, shit. Yeah. And then the youngest is Walter. Oh, um, I think another kind of fun thing about both Melissa and Walter is that the two of them actually both had roles in two other films that I've recently reviewed, one of which was Leprechaun. Fuck you, Lucky Charms. Um, so <laughs> Walter is in Leprechaun, and Melissa is also in Halloween 4. No! 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 So they, the darker genre. Yes, <laughs> yes, he is. I mean, this is dark. Yeah. It's just less, there's only one death. Yeah. They also have a dog named Elvis. And Elvis new two toys. I think like all of the 90s, like early 2000 movies have at least one character named Elvis. That's my theory. I noticed the trays match your outfits. Did you plan that? I know. We're going to be talking about Detroit Rock City soon. Spoiler. There's an Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so the mom heads off to Australia. Her parting words to the kids are take care of each other. Um, and as soon as the mom gets out of sight, the babysitter, this old, old lady, goes from being a sweet old lady, Mrs. Sturak, she blows her whistle, we get the Twilight Zone music, and... The scowl sets yeah. in. She's just a bitch. All right, you little maggots, now line up. Um, we already, we already hate her. She makes Melissa wear a girly girl dress, which of course Melissa has no interest in doing. She Everybody's basically has got to put on name tags. I really don't think I can live like this. I do think that's funny. <laughs> it was kind of helpful for me because there's so many kids that that's I was true. like in the beginning yeah. of the movie. I was like, oh, this is actually kind of nice. Let's keep them in the name tags. <laughs> she is Mrs. Sturak is too afraid of Kenny's room to do anything anything to him. Yeah. 
he never actually meets her before she dies. Um, so lucky Kenny. Not that if he had met her, he would have remembered it. Kenny's a little bit of a stoner. Yeah. So the kids decide to try to kind of take back over. Um, and when they do that, they discover that Mrs. Sturak is dead. And instead of, you know, calling the cops as one might do, they decide that they're going to put her in a trunk and drop her off to save the ambulance people a trip. Um, so they so put her yeah, so they, considerate. They put her in this package that says, nice old lady died of natural causes. Um, Which would never, you know, not cause suspicious. any any yeah, no flags. <laughs> no no not, flags. Not even a little bit. Now who would do such a thing? Okay, so what would you do if your babysitter died? If she was supposed to be my babysitter for two months, yeah, I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably, see, what I would have done is I would have called the cops, gotten rid of her, and then I would have just told the cops I have an aunt to stay with and just lied to my aunt, too. Yeah. Sorry, aunt. That's a way better plan. That's what I would have done. They have no consequences no. from the fact that it very much looks like they murdered her. There are no consequences for these kids at yeah. any point in the film. Nobody appears to have ever investigated. Nope. They do not care at all. But there is, there actually is a good reason for that. The two gentlemen at the morgue that buried this sweet old lady acquired all of her cash. So they had reason to not say anything when they buried her. That's a really good point. That was that was the only thing that actually made sense. Yeah. That wasn't totally far fetched <laughs> in the movie is is why those two people didn't didn't ever say anything. They made off with well, let's see, it was thirty years ago. It was probably a couple couple grand. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Lucky them. Yeah. That's such a good point. I never thought about that. You're so right. <laughs> so the house is going to shit. The kids don't know how to take care of anything. They're all irresponsible as and they realize that now they need money um, and they have to stick together. So Kenny and Swell decide to flip a Mama Celeste, Mama pizza, Celeste pizza in order to determine which one of them has to get a job. You and I used to eat a lot of Mama Celeste also. Okay. I say, Mom, you make a perfect sauce, a perfect toppings, make a perfect crust. Was they that were because all, of this they movie? Were, no. No, they were all... The mini ones? The pizza for one. Yeah. You put them in the microwave for two minutes and you got your little pizza. <laughs> They're so good. Yeah. I they, was going to get one for us for today to flip, but I forgot you, it. I don't know if you can still You can. Them. Yeah, I think they're a Dollar Tree also. We used to get them for just a dollar. Yeah. Sounds like somebody's living in the past. Contemporize, man. Now they're a dollar twenty-five. At the dollar, mm -hmm. at the dollar tree, I didn't know the dollar tree had that. I think they still do. I think I've seen them they at Wegmans too. They can't be as good as they used to. Oh, be. they are. We, I went through a huge Mama Celeste phase recently. Oh. Mama Celeste has made it even more delicious. It's not too crispy, not too chewy. It's just perfect. Oh, I can't help myself. My mom would get ten at a time from the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> Between the four of us, we'd have. We'd each have, you know, one after school or whatever. What do you think your siblings would do if the babysitter died? Do you think that you would be in this scenario where, like, nobody was cleaning the house, everybody was just kind of fucking you know, off? My sister would freak out and do the right thing. Dang it. Stupid Responsible. My younger brother. I got a feeling that he would just leave the body in the room and <laughs> not open the door for two months. Yikes. Because it was summertime in California. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my older brother, he might kind of play it out like the movie. I don't, I don't know. I could see you guys doing it. Yeah. This. I could see you and I being the stoner kids and not giving a fuck about anything yeah. and enjoying it too much. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what would you do? What would I do? Oh, God. Hey. When did my parents ever give me rules? It was, if my parents were home, it didn't matter. <laughs> you just never would have been in this situation. I never would have been. The babysitter never would have been there. I never would have been in this situation. <laughs> I would have eaten Mama Celeste. <laughs> I cut down to one slice a day. Okay, so Swell loses the Mama Celeste flip, yeah. and she has to go work in fast food at the Clown Dog. Hey, you gotta squeeze the fat out of those burgers, man. So, what I want to know is... It was a 50-50 chance. What would have happened if Mama Celeste went face down 
And Kenny had to get a job. Joke. He never could have survived a job. Right? I want to see that movie, though. That's that's what the remake should have been. Oh, that would have been so much better than what they're doing. I haven't seen it yet, so can't say anything about it yet. But it kind of looks like they're just remaking it yeah. with, you know, the times. But I want to know what happens with Kenny. If, had to yeah. Work. If the total degenerate has to get a job, oh my god, he never would have had such a character arc like he yeah. has. And you know, Do you think he would have also worked at the Clown Dog? Yeah, and then it, they still could have taken him on that culinary journey that he, he oh, goes yeah. on. Making the fancy schmancy waffles for his stoner friends. Beautiful Belgian waffles. But, um, <laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> Okay, so Swell and Brian kind of click, but Swell hates working at the Clown Dog. So she pretty much immediately quits and then fakes her entire resume, um, saying that she went to Vassar and fashion institutes. Glamorous fashion stuff. Borrows her mom's clothes. Um, and so she gets a job at a fashion firm called Gaw, G-A-W. Yeah. Um, which designs uniforms. She thought she was going to an exciting fashion industry. Yeah. This is where we get one of the most quotable moments of the film because when she goes to interview for this job, she meets a girl at the desk who says to her, you are going to be going to personnel. You are supposed to go down to personnel. That is on the first floor. There is a great big sign that says, Personnel, do you understand? Shut the fuck up, you cunt! <laughs> and she is just a bitch. So that's Carolyn, and Carolyn will come into play later in the film, because Carolyn, as it turns out, is also Brian's I'm Brian. older sister. That's right. Um, so, of course, we're going to get some crossover. We're going to have to see Swell navigating all of the lies that she's telling. Because now that she has gotten a job as an executive assistant at this fashion firm, she's going to have a little bit of a problem because she's only 17. And not only is she 17 starting a new job, this job has technology that she's never seen before. There's a fax machine. There's a big old computer. <laughs> I hate you. She does not know how to work any of this. No, she does not. She is a very much fake it till you make it kind of situation. But this does solve the problem of the fact that the kids have no money, no babysitter. They need money. Yeah. So her boss is Rose, who is played by Joanna Cassidy, who's also in Blade Runner, of course. Little, uh... Dirty holes, they uh, drill in the walls so they can watch a lady undress. And Rose is quirky. She wants, any time that she's asking a question, she always wants Swell to say, I'm right on top of that, Rose. Another, no what. another amazing one-liner. Erica and I work together, and we have a couple of coworkers who say this quote every day. Yeah. Anytime <laughs> that one or the other of them is trying to do something, I'm right on top of that, Rose. <laughs> I'm right on top of that, Rose. We also get to meet Gus, who is the vice president of marketing at Gaw. He's a pervy asshole. He is just the worst. But yeah, his facial expressions and everything that comes out of his mouth <laughs> are just so absurd. Bye. <laughs> Completely Which is in line with the movie. So now that they have this newfound money, they can finally go grocery shopping and get all of the things that they need. But at one point when they go grocery shopping, they are still using Mrs. Sturek's car because she's dead, so she doesn't need it anymore. They, it, the car gets stolen by drag queens. Yeah. There's a Marilyn Monroe drag queen. There's Liza, Liza Minnelli. Minnelli yeah. There's a third one that I can't remember for the life of me. No. That is such a throwaway scene, but it's also so goofy. Yeah. Like, I just love it. There's no reason to have it be drag queens that are stealing the car. There's no, none of that makes sense whatsoever. But now they are carless. And they can't do anything about it because they shouldn't have even had that car. Yes. So they can't call the cops. 
Um, so they get Brian, the clown dog boy, Brian. to come and pick them up in his lovely clown dog yeah. car. What I always wondered is, why is he playing the music when he's driving the car <laughs> at, at 9 p.m.? You know, <laughs> why, why is the music still playing? It's so stupid. You know, it's like if he if he drove an ice cream truck, it wouldn't be playing music. No. You know, you can turn that music off, but off. yeah. He was showing up because he does weird flags. <laughs> he does. He does actually ask Swell out here and they decide that they are going to go on a Grunion run. They're going to go watch the Grunion run, which I swear to God. Do you know what a Grunion is? Oh, I had to look it up. Okay, it's a fish. California Grunion are found off the coast of California. They are among the few species of fish that actually come ashore in order to lay their eggs on sandy beaches. Since Grunion are considered good eating, People are often waiting to harvest them when they leap on shore. The shore leaping event is called a grunion run, and it only lasts for a few hours. During a grunion run, grunion can only legally be caught with bare hands. Thousands of grunion may be on the beach at once. Females swim ashore usually accompanied by one or more males. Females wriggle in the sand tail first to lay eggs while the males wrap around them in order to fertilize the eggs. Kinky. Yeah. So almost every 90s movie, I swear to God, they're all making references to grunion runs. I think it's exclusively in California. It's, like, it's gross. I don't know why it would be a thing that you're like, yeah, let me go a watch. Apparently it's quite magical. But it's tons of, I don't understand why all these movies are making reference to it. There's references to it in The Little Mermaid. There's references to it in um, Fuck Polly Shore. Um, Son-in-law? Yeah, that's, that's the my one. My favorite. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember them referencing Grunion. Yeah, they do. He's, he's like sitting and there's like a loudspeaker Grunion comment. Huh. Anyway, there's a ton of Grunion references in movies from the 90s. Why yeah. is that? So Swell is failing at this job. She's getting help from one of her coworkers, Kathy, because she has literally no idea what yeah. to do at any point or any time. Well, I'm a whiz on the computer, so if you ever have anything from me, just ask. But she is very happy because her salary is going to be $37,000. $37,500 a year. Which is actually a really fucking good salary for back then, yeah. which I'm a little bit pissed off about. Right. That's pretty darn good. I mean, I could have... Typed up a resume from a book mm -hmm. that I rented from the library mm -hmm. and made 40 grand a year. Yeah. Wow. Sounds great. Why weren't we doing that in 1991? They were like, <laughs> go to college. <laughs> what, a, what a crock. <laughs> <laughs> this becomes an issue because she realizes that she's not going to get paid for two weeks yeah. and they have no more food. Um, so she steals petty cash from the job. She's very excited to learn what petty cash is. That's yeah. how non-career focus this new career woman is yeah. so she opens this little cash box and it, that's just sitting at her desk this whole time she never knew about and there are thousands and thousands of dollars just stacked in there which is kind of weird why why wasn't that money in a bank i just i just don't <laughs> it's a lot of money we work such hellish hours around here no one has time to go to the bank i would think petty cash would be a few a hundred couple dollars hundred bucks because it's for you know lunch or whatever not not, not what's in there. Not what's in there. Not what's in there. We do get to meet another character that Swell is working with, which is David Duchovny's character, a yeah. pre-X-Files David Duchovny. Yes. Hey, who are you? Where's that other broad, uh, Mona? He looks like a freaking baby in yeah, this. Yeah, honest to God. Is he 15? I know. Oh my God, it's crazy. He's very 80s in this yeah. film. <laughs> very, yes. very 80s. I don't have all day. So as Swell is working constantly, the home continues going to shit. Mom keeps calling home. Mom never gets a name in the film also. Who cares about her identity, am I right? So one of the times that Mom calls home, we get your and my favorite line of favorite this line. film. Mom calls home and asks, where's the babysitter? She's talking to Kenny, who is caught off guard and an idiot. And an idiot, yeah. And probably stoned. Yep. Where is the babysitter? She's she went to the yarn, yarn store. store. Why does she need so much yarn? She's yeah, crocheting, she's crocheting this massive, massive doily, doily for the couch. couch. Man. <laughs> what a stupid... <laughs> so he, he spits out this absurd lie and then just goes... I gotta go, Mom. <laughs> and hangs up on his mom. <laughs> and she's fine with that. Oh, yeah. She doesn't call back, want to check in on the other kids. Yeah, no. She's Who just cares? like, oh. Yeah. 
Okay, the giant doily. She never asks about it when she gets bad. I know. There's not even a single giant doily. (laughs) We've talked about making a giant doily for the couch when we've never done it. And you started to. I did. You did. One day. We did have a bunch of small doilies. Yeah, that we were going to stitch together. Stitch together (laughs) and make a massive doily. It wouldn't have been very warm or comfortable. No, it would not. It would have belonged on a couch for a 90-year-old woman. Only for decorative purposes. Yeah. But. Despite the fact that there are five kids in this family, the two kids that we follow around the most closely are, of course, Swell and Kenny. And the two of them, they start out as, obviously, siblings, but it becomes almost like a husband-wife relationship. Yeah. What's wrong with you? Nothing is wrong with me. So Kenny starts to take on a little bit more responsibility around the house. They start bickering like an old married couple where she's like, I've been working all day. And I had to work late, okay? You still should have called. And he's like, well, you don't even care about the food that I made you. I'm sick and tired of not being appreciated. I appreciate you. Eat shit. Because Kenny is developing a love for the culinary arts. After finding Julia Child on the TV with their remote control that is this big. (laughs) (laughs) When are you going to do a cake? You really have to have a battle plan already so that when you start in, you can just go right through the cake. You don't want to go out and play croquet in the middle, for instance. And he he makes very impressive meals for someone who just picked up cooking. He does. He does. He also, at one point, is told by Swell that he must mow the lawn and do the dishes. Which leads us into yet another great one-liner, which is that Kenny and all of his buds, including Hellhound and I can't remember the other names, Honest but they're all God, stupid a names. Razor Blade might yeah. have been one yeah. of them. They were just really awful, yeah. awful cheesy names. Yeah. PMS City Man. <laughs> so they all go up on the roof in order to do the dishes, and they do like the pigeon clay. We're gonna throw this dish in the air, and then Kenny shoots it and says. Have you ever had a 48-hour orgasm? And our coworkers also say that line all the time. And I think I made you a little graphic of that. Oh, yeah. But the question is, where are the clean dishes? Do they have dishes? <laughs> I guess Petty Cash takes the care only, of that. The <laughs> only other dish that I feel like we really see that gets, like, highlighted in the film is when Swell makes breakfast for all the kids. Yeah. And she puts it in a giant, um... It's a punch bowl. Yeah, a punch it's bowl. It's a punch bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she just puts cereal in an entire in there. an entire box of cereal. Captain Crunch. And an entire carton of milk. It's yeah. Stupid. Very wasteful too for people that should be budgeting. Yes. Very, very wasteful. So Swell back at work starts getting hit on by Gus. Gus has no idea how old she is, obviously. Do people always tell you how young you look? Gus takes her out for lunch at one point and she orders a martini and rosy <laughs> vermouth. <laughs> Um, on the rocks, and the waiter is like, would you like dry or sweet? And she goes, oh, just a little bit of both. And the waiter acts like that's the weirdest thing right? in the entire world, but have you heard of a perfect martini? Yeah. Hey, hold on, slow down, you're moving too fast for me. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's a weird drink order, but it's not the weirdest drink order I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah. I wouldn't drink it. Mm-mm, not a chance in hell. Actually, I have both of those here. If you want to have, if you want to try, you want to, you want to try a little bit of each. It's a special occasion. Gus orders an ever so classy, manly white wine spritzer. <laughs> Nobody orders those anymore. Did anyone that... ever really order them? All right, good point. Like good some, point. maybe some ladies. Yeah. A white wine spritzer. 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 Also a very old school drink. Yeah. Um, Swell goes on a second date with Brian Clown Dog Boy, and they go to a toy store. Great date. And they bounce around on those, like, little bouncy balls. Yeah. Bounce right into each other's hearts. Yeah. Juices start flowing. <laughs> but she starts, Swell starts getting kind of secretive with him, and they get a f- into a fight about it. I just wish that you could respect my privacy, that's all. Yeah, well, I would respect your privacy if you weren't so secretive. And the reason that she starts getting secretive is because she learns that Carolyn, the bitchy receptionist, is actually his sister. Swell knows that it's possible that she is going to get found out. She doesn't want that because she needs that money. She doesn't want to go back to working at Clown Dog, obviously. Another thing that happens around this time in the film is that Swell is having a conversation with Rose, her boss. And Rose makes this offhanded comment about how she should put cucumbers over her eyes. And Swell was like, oh, I don't have any cucumbers. And Rose's response to that is, no woman over 25 should ever be without a cucumber. Which is a pretty pervy line, right? It is. That's the implication. It is. 
car. I really need to get away. I think that that's kind of the most perverse line in the film, which is interesting because this was rated PG-13. I think that this film could have been absolutely outstanding if it was rated R. Oh yeah, I, absolutely. This movie, you might notice that a lot of what we're doing is just kind of talking through the film, and that's because honestly there's not a ton to talk about. It's a fun watch. You have fun while you're watching it. But there's not a lot of meat and potatoes in yeah. this one. <laughs> there's not a ton. And I think that if they had pushed for that R rating and had decided against trying to do PG-13, that we would have gotten a lot more black humor. We would have gotten a lot more, yeah. you know, it would have almost been the the predecessor to American Pie, I think is what this could have been if only they had been okay with taking that R rating. We'll just tell your mother that, uh, that uh, we ate it all. But Christina Applegate was the highlight of the movie. Yes. So they were appealing to who was watching her at that time. The Married with Children fans. The married, yeah, the Married with Children fans. So they, they didn't want to exclude a lot of their their audience that would have gone to see her. Yeah, that's a really good point. And yeah. they were putting the TV spots in the Married with Children advertising all the time. Like, that was all the ads. And all of the TV spots, also, I watched a bunch of them, all of the TV spots are just Christina Applegate and um, Keith Coogan. There's, like, no, it doesn't show the other yeah. kids. It doesn't show anybody else. Though That's the highlight of this film, <laughs> which is accurate, I guess. Yeah, it is. It is. Although, Brian is an afterthought. Many times. Yes. Many times. It's true. And again, we love Gus. Next thing you know, we'll be sharing a cigarette in post-coital bliss. It's true. Thank you, Gus. All right, so the climax of this film is that Gaw, the fashion company of fanciness... Going yeah, down because nobody wants drab, ugly uniforms. Yeah. Uh, but luckily, Christina Applegate, with all of her youth and wisdom, realizes that she might be able to save the company by making school uniforms and other uniforms exciting and hip. And woo, it's going to so be amazing. And she does this by simply walking through... The floor, the, the, the inventory the warehouse, floor. Yeah. The, the clothing warehouse, and she just, she sees this, and she sees that, and she, she finds a fun tassel, and it is the coolest thing ever. You gotta throw together your craziness. Yeah. Um, Shoulder pads and tassels. It's true. And, you know, you gotta win. It's true, it's true. <laughs> so, Christina Applegate Rose charges her with setting up this fashion show in order to get some more buyers interested in their brand. And Christina Applegate sneakily decides, because she has taken all of the petty cash, she sneakily decides that she is going to have the party at her house because she has a very nice house. And this is when the family finally starts really banding together. All right, Slaw, we're with you. Rock and roll! All the kids are helping her get ready, even... You know, Kenny's degenerate friend. Whisking the couch. Yes, he's whisking the couch. He's so proud of me. I mean, I never asked you to whisk the couch. Well, it needed it. Have you, you ever, ever seen that? that? I mean, I like when you like beat a carpet or something right? outside, but I've never heard of whisking. Whisking. The couch. <laughs> I love that line too. <laughs> it's a really good one. So she ends up holding this party. The receptionist, Carolyn, and David Duchovny discover her license, prove that she's really 17. She's only 17. And at this party, at this big event, they go to Rose to tell her this. And Rose is like, you guys suck. You're immature and stupid. Whatever. Swell is amazing. This is by far and away the most petty, spiteful, vindictive machination you have ever concocted. Grow up, Carolyn. Well, let's see how amazing Smell really is. First of all, let's talk about the fashion show. Whew. That's some fashion. It, it really is. I feel like everybody looked like a weird version of Harley Quinn. There's like all these like On diamonds. Halloween too, nonetheless. I mean, the shorts are, or the skirts are barely covering yeah. anything. I mean, if they weren't wearing tights. It would be a thing. <laughs> it it would have been an R-rated movie. Yeah. It would have been an X-rated movie, actually. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so all of the freaking outfits are completely absurd. There's, like, these, like, Harley Quinn diamonds. 
on everything. And of course, it's the 90s. So we've got orange and lime green tights paired with hot pink and... Everybody's hair is floofed up in a ponytail. Yeah. Uh, I think that the nurse's outfit was the most absurd of all of them. Her bottom butt is like hanging out of it. She's wearing lace-up shoes. Can you imagine being a nurse wearing lace-up shoes? That sounds like hell. Right? Like and the least functional uniforms of all time. And the pink stethoscope to tie it all together. <laughs> and of course, no nurse would be complete without her stethoscope necklace. The only outfit that I thought was like sort of okay for the job. So like she makes different uniforms for different roles. So like you have a chef's uniform, you have, you know, et cetera. The, the stewardess. The stewardesses. <laughs> uh, the bell hops. Yeah. The only one that I thought was, like, even sort of acceptable was the referee outfit. Yeah. That one kind of looked like maybe you might be a referee and that you wouldn't be extremely uncomfortable wearing it while you were being a referee. But it's just, it's so confusing as to whether she's making updated versions of the uniforms for these professions or if she's making these for the high schooler to wear to school. Yeah, it's true. Because that was originally her task. Yeah, so I don't think of a time in high school where I ever thought, I want to look like a doctor today. <laughs> or You don't want to be a bellhop? I want to look like a flight attendant today. <laughs> but it was and, such a great fashion show. Yeah, everybody loved it. Yeah, except for the fact that two not-so-great things happened during the fashion show. The first one is that Brian shows up in the clown dog truck music with the music playing. playing. <laughs> Well, it's me, it's Brian. I'm Brian. And he is trying to win Swell back after the fight that they yeah. had earlier in the film. Also, fuck you, Brian. Yeah. There's hundreds of cars in her driveway, and you just keep plowing <laughs> through, uh, talking Brian. on the microphone. Like, fuck you. Yeah. He's stupid. <laughs> He's stupid. Douche move. Yeah. Dick move. Yeah. She should say no to him. <laughs> right? Yeah. This is, of course, when everything starts unraveling. However, it's not the worst of the things that happen because also mom shows up in the middle of the fashion Surprise! show. She's a week early. What? Busted. Oh. She could not wait to get back to her kids who she hasn't talked to. <laughs> she doesn't care at for all. For two months. The mom at first is pissed, but then she pretty quickly goes to being impressed. Because she starts piecing together everything. Also, how the hell could she not walk into that house and comment about how clean it was? Yeah. She does see it at one point, she, and she, she's like... She's, she's walking around, but she looks more at the entertainment stand. Oh, the entertainment stand. <laughs> and is more impressed by that than the house. I mean, their house, it was... Spick Dirt. and span. Yeah, the, it, the it couches went, were whisked. Exactly. Beautiful. The, the house was immaculately cleaned, and when she left, total mess. Yeah. Dishes piled high in the kitchen, and that deserved at least a great job, kiddos. And did you ever notice their pool before no, the party? That pool was stunning. Don't you want it that? It was pool? a beautiful pool. Well, they did do the clean out of the pool right before the party. Yeah. Which is also weird because the pool is empty when they're cleaning it. So they emptied the pool, cleaned the pool, refilled the pool all before this party? Yeah. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. For these lazy, lazy children. It was a huge house. It was a huge house. Beautiful house. Yeah. I would live there on my $37,000 a <laughs> year salary. <laughs> right. With many petty caches to yes. steal. So Rose, everything has unraveled at this point for Swell. And Rose is now aware that Swell is a high schooler who is useless. However, Rose does not give a fuck because everybody, all the buyers are still interested in GAW. Um, and they even are impressed by the fact that Rose was so intuitive to hire somebody with youth for perspective. Right. We're all just a bunch of old whores. Uh-huh. So that answers that. The clothes are for your average high schooler. So weird. Shame on her for only having girls. Yeah. Right? Yeah, what were the boys wearing? Oh. You having a party? What were the boys What's the boy wear? nurse wearing? What are the firemen wearing? <laughs> yeah, why didn't we get firemen <laughs> yeah, outfits? Right? 
I would have enjoyed that. Right? Kenny in a fireman hound, outfit. Hound dog and... <laughs> oh, yeah. Racer blade. They should have been in that. I, I think so. Hell, Hellhound also. But yes. um, Hellhound is also in the stoned age. I like him a lot, the redhead. <laughs> He's super cute. I think you know how I feel. I, I do. <laughs> anyway, moving on. In the end, Brian and Swell forgive each other. They're back together. Everything is happy. Rose offers Swell a job, but Swell wants to go into design school. Kenny is now reformed. He wants to be a culinary master. Everybody's some shit like happy. That. The movie ends with the mom asking, but where's the babysitter? Oh, yeah. And then we get no resolution to that. No resolution whatsoever. Yay! <laughs> nothing, nothing weird about that. <laughs> nothing happens. Nobody gets their comeuppance. All right, so the final sequence that we get in the film during the end credits is when the mortuary guys are going to visit Mrs. Sturak's grave. Bring her some fresh flowers. Because she gave them all that money. Yeah. Gave. Um, so on the grave, they actually end up writing the same thing that was on the trunk in the beginning of the film, which, which is nice old lady died of natural causes. I'm really going to miss her. You never even knew her. Yeah, but she left us all the money. She's already dead, you moron. Well, that's true. Hey, how about Vegas this weekend? Got any money left? And then we roll credits. With no fun animation. No fun animation. You were so right about that. That would have really tied this film together. But some fun music. Oh, there, <laughs> there really isn't a very good score for this film. The yeah. only thing that I thought was interesting score-wise was that during the scene where she is first stealing the money from uh, the petty cash box, uh, the song that's playing is Gimme Some Money by Spinal Tap. Yeah. You don't hear a lot of Spinal Tap songs <laughs> in movies that are not This Is Spinal Tap. So that's that's, that's kind of cool. All right, so tell me your final thoughts on this film. We obviously love this movie. We do. But I don't know that it's the greatest of all movies. I think it's a big nostalgia film for us. It's a nostalgia film. Um, it it's still fun. It's it's a fun movie, but it's it's not deep. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's, no, not deep. it's not thought provoking. It's it, it but it's also it's not laugh out loud funny. Nothing nothing in the film really leaves you. In, cackling in stitches but it, it's just it's fun and it's lighthearted for the concept of babysitter somebody is dead. died all right so what would you give this movie on a score of one to seven thumbs up one to seven thumbs up i'd give it a five I think I'm with you on that, actually. You give it a five. I love it, and I love revisiting it. Yeah. And when I am not thinking about it in a film critique sense, I am just having a blast while I'm watching it. It's true. You can re you can rewatch it. You can rewatch it a thousand times. You can quote it constantly. This is done, man. Is it a masterpiece? Fuck no. No. Yeah, babe. Justice is served. Are there any things that you think would have made it a masterpiece? I think that rating R, I think that could have. I think that would have really helped. Rated R. It got the rating it got because of its rewatchability. Yes. For me. Yeah, absolutely. I will absolutely rewatch this yep. a thousand more times. I'm going to enjoy it every single time that I watch it. Far from a masterpiece, though. Thank you so much, Erica, for hanging out with me. I absolutely love talking with Erica about films that we watched when we were kids. Over that and we over again. Still watch now. Yep. Because that is just a super fun thing to do with somebody that you care a lot about. Later. Yeah, just one or two. <laughs> one or two since we were teenagers. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> um, and thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see you all in the next one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>